if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. For without me, ye can do nothing. Without me, ye can do nothing. Nothing. I'm afraid I've done a lot of nothing. I'm afraid I've been in a lot of church services filled with nothing. The church of Ephesus is the first church that Jesus addresses in the book of Revelation. And it's interesting what he says. He says, I know your work. I know your labor. I know your patience. I know your discernment because you have, you have found them which say they're apostles and are not. You abhor that which is evil. I know your commitment. You have not fainted. You've showed up Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and you've continued to do the things that you're doing. You sing songs and you preach sermons and you pray prayers. But notice what he says. You have done the, ap the exact opposite of what I told you to do in John 15. You have left. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. We can either abide or leave. He says, I have one thing against you, Ephesus. You have left your first love. I have no desire for church without connection anymore. Church without connection, what do you mean, Gordon? Abiding in Christ, connected with Him in all that we do. It's all about Him, it's all for Him, it's all because of Him, it's all through Him. Anything else that we do is nothing 
It's nothing. It's a whole bunch of nothing. And listen. This is why the church is filled with people who profess Christ and are living in misery and defeat and carnality and sin. And could you blame them? Because the system has taught them that. What's the system you're talking about, Gordon? Church. Have not churches taught you that, that God happens between a certain time period? The church has taught you that you put God between this time and this time. And serious churches taught you that you put revival between this date and that date. And we're just going to show up and God's going to do what we expect Him to do because we expect it. And so you leave the church and you go home. And you put God in certain time windows. And time frames. And dates. And if most of you were honest this morning, you would say, I'm sick of that. I love the Lord, but I'm sick of that. Some of you would even say, I'm sick of it, Gordon, but I don't know how to get off of this train that I'm on. Paul is telling us in this chapter, put it off. Just... Take it off. Get rid of it. Cast it down. Throw it away. And as we discussed last week, some of you are like, oh, um, but Gordon, at least I have on something. Gordon, do you know what's underneath this? Oh, yeah. I do. But if I take this off, I'm going to expose myself for what I really am. Some of you are like, what does he say? If I take off the church entity, I'm left with me. Gordon, I don't like the real me, and I don't think God likes him either, or her. And I'm pretty sure no one in this room is going to like him either. That's not true. God loves the real you. And he has been longing to interact with the real you but you've been pretending to be something else, living a persona that either churches put on you or your parents put on you or your spouse put on you or your friends put on you or maybe you put on yourself. And you wonder, why am I not growing? Why do I not feel closer to the Lord than I was then? Because it's time to put it off. And that's vulnerable. It's vulnerable. I can see some of your faces. You're just not there, and that's okay. You're like, don't sound vulnerable to me. Matter of fact, I think I'd look pretty good. Yeah, they taught you to say that. So they taught you if you checked all the boxes and did everything that they say that you'd be a good little boy or a little girl and they would accept you. And you could be a part of their number. 
But is that really what you want? Do you really want to be accepted by a church or a denomination? Or do you want to be accepted by God? Do you want to walk side by side and hand in hand with, with, with people? Or do you want to walk with the Lord? Yeah, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. So we got to put off the old man. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. New. Isn't the word new better than old? Yes. yes, it is. So we'll pick up our study in verse 10. He says, And have put on, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Wow, that is a jam-packed verse. And have put on the new man, which is renewed... How many of you know that God wants to renew you? He wants to renew you. But notice how you're to be renewed. In knowledge. Knowledge. It's epigenosis in the Greek. It is the equivalent, for those of you who have been here on Wednesday nights, it's the equivalent to the Hebrew yada. I've been having over the last several years multiple yada moments. The world would call them aha moments. But aha moments take place up here. Yada moments take place here. We have a church full of people who know they're supposed to pray, know they're supposed to read their Bible, know they're supposed to witness, know they're supposed to come to church, know they're supposed to do all these things, and they're doing their very best to do those things. And they're being devoured by the enemy and by the world. Paul is saying, put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul said this, if you remember, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In Romans, he said, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. I'm going to say something very boring to many and very outdated to many. This is how you renew your mind. And it doesn't happen through osmosis. You don't put it on the nightstand beside you when you go to bed and some, you know, when you're asleep, it just glows and then it shoots some rays. That's not how it happens. Renewed in knowledge. This idea is knowing God. Do I really know God? I know we all know of God, but do I know Him? Or would I be like the Pharisees when He walked up to me? Would I not recognize Him? Because he doesn't look the way that I thought he would look. He doesn't act the way that I thought he should act. He doesn't follow my little checklist and rules. And he doesn't even line up with all of the little denominational things that I have. Or would I recognize him from afar? That is my beloved. And I am his. And notice what he says. It's renewed in knowledge. After the image of him that created him. Every day of your life, you should be becoming more like Christ. Christ. 
Human nature fights that. As a matter of fact, John had some people around him who were, were helping him with his ministry, and they all kind of clashed with him because he was just different. He just he didn't do what other people did, and, and they were trying to, to, to make things happen. He didn't dress like he was. They tried to get him to dress for success, and he just, he just didn't. You know, they were like, hey, man, if you can't afford it, we'll go buy you a nice robe like the Pharisees wear. Because, dude, that camel coat is just... Really, man? Nobody is going to be impressed by that. Nobody's going to be attracted by that. And that belt, dude, you're just weird, man. And why do you come way out here to the wilderness? Have you not heard location, location, location? You need to go where the people are. Then Jesus comes along and he baptizes him. And the very next Sunday, he has less people in his service. And the deacons and the elders are like, bruh, we have talked to you about your coat. We have talked to you about your bushy beard and your, 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 your leather Levi belt. And it's, we, we've been trying our best. We've been patient with you. We've been trying to change you, man. We have been trying to refine you. We've been trying to help you understand what draws a crowd. And John said, he must increase. And then he says, I must decrease. If I put a glass of tea up here on this shelf, and then I had a huge pitcher of water, and I start pouring water in that glass, and then I go fill up the pitcher again, and I keep pouring water, it's, it's overflowing, what will eventually happen? Eventually, the glass will be only filled with water. But even our sermons are about us. We like read David and Goliath and we're like, go out there and be a David. What? I have never resembled that. Nor have you. Oh, yes, I have. Matter of fact, I got my sling right here. If there's any takeaway from that, it's Christ went into the valley and defeated the enemy. We were the ones hiding behind the rock. But Gordon, that's not as exciting, bro. That's not how they talk on TED Talks. That's not the way they talk down the street at that other church. When I go to that other church, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel good about myself. Oh. Really? Well, yes, of course, and I like it. I'm sure you do. When we leave a service, we should be feeling good about Christ. Right? It ain't about my image. It's not about your image. It's not about the Southern Baptist image or the Church of God image or the Pentecostal image or the Assembly of God image or the method. You can go. It's not about that, but we've made it that. We have made it that. And so we come to services and we come to services and we sing songs and we. We hear verses and we leave still looking like us and still acting like us. And do you know that some aren't coming, coming anymore because they're discouraged and disheartened? And if you ask them, they'll say, there was nothing to that. It didn't work. But it does work. A hundred times out of a hundred, it works. And I'm thrilled this morning to tell you the gospel works. It works. 
And there's a God who wants to change every single one of us. Do you know that in Romans chapter 8, God says you were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Is there anyone in this room that could tell me of a higher goal? Anybody want to be bold enough? Nobody wants to make a fool of themselves this morning. That's God's plan for my life, for your life, is to make you like Christ. That's what he wants to do. Yes, wow. Amen, brother. Wow. I agree with no. Wow. Really? Wow. That's what God wants to do with my life? Yes. Okay. How do I do that? Because, listen, Gordon, I've tried. I've tried to be like Jesus. I've tried. He says, turn the other cheek. And then I finished the verse. And I feel terrible after I finished the verse because somehow in my heart I realized by the Holy Spirit that's not what he would have done. How do you become like Christ? How does that happen? He says we're to put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after, 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 after the image. After the image. So that image is is outside of me. It's being formed in me. But, but, to, but to look to the image, it's outside of me after the image of him that created him. One of my favorite passages of scripture, I quote it all the time, 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, you know that James says this is a mirror, a glass, beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into that same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We want to microwave faith. We do, right? We want to show up to church and you want me to give you the 15 steps and you want to write them down and Kudos to you, high five, for writing them down, those of you who are, and I'm wondering why the other, no, I'm just kidding. So, so you write those things down, and then you go, and you're like, okay, step number one. Step number one, smile. I feel stupid, but I'm smiling. I'm doing what the preacher said. Step number two, be nice. Step number one, <laughs> Listen, church, we make a grave mistake in thinking that prayer and Bible reading are the end. When we think that that's the end, right? The preacher told you, read your Bible and pray every single day. Read your Bible and pray every single day. Now, it's not wrong to read your Bible and pray every single day. You should. But if all you're doing is reading your Bible and praying every single day, focusing on that being the end, I read my Bible, check. Check. Lord, I pray that you'd be with Aunt Susie with her high blood pressure. They've been trying to make it regulated, and they just can't. So I just ask, Lord, that you'd give the doctors wisdom on that and, and just help Susie feel better. And yeah, I can't think of anybody else, Lord, but you know, you know all the needs in the world, so you know, just help all those people. And I'm going to go to work now, and amen. Check. Weeks go by, months go by, years go by. I keep coming to the church. I keep doing that. And I get stuck in a cycle. I 
get stuck in a cycle. And I never seem to get past it. Because reading your Bible and praying is not the end, church. It's a means to the end. Because reading your Bible is a means to which, we're going to read in just a moment, a, a means to which you know Christ. Praying is a means to which you have devotion and dialogue with Him. Conversations like Jesus had with Nicodemus. Where you leave church, read your quiet time, and you spend time either in the morning, middle of the day, lunch hour, in the afternoon, sitting on the porch, cup of coffee, tea, whatever it is, and you say, Lord, I don't understand. How can a man be born when he's old? This doesn't make sense to me. Help me, Lord. That is when change starts taking place. When you and I start living like we serve a living God. Instead of some podium or, or monument or something that we come and lay a few flowers and maybe, you know, our little offering, some sugar, or I don't know. And we're like, it's renewed in knowledge. It's in me knowing him. How am I going to know when I'm becoming more like him if I don't know what he is like? How can I even discern whether the Holy Spirit is working in me? Amen? Okay. Let's keep going. I love this. Wow. Man, every one of these verses we could just... Where there is neither Greek nor Jew circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. In the book of Galatians, he adds this, male nor female. This new man is in a new family. And Christ is all and in all. Ladies and gentlemen, Fashion your seatbelts. Fasten, not fashion. You can fashion them. I guess you could bedazzle them. if. You, but fasten your seatbelt. There's no Jew or Gentile in Christ. National, nationalism is on the rise in this country and in the church. Thy America come. Here on earth, as it once was here on earth, back, well, whenever. Thy kingdom come. Jew, Gentile. Oh, I got, I struck some nerves. Up in here, I, I didn't expect we might have to slow down here. American. I know you are. I'm a disciple who was born in America. And I would be a disciple if I was born in South America. And I would be a disciple if I was born in Uganda. And I would be a disciple if I was born in Russia. Don't say that word. <laughs> there is no more Jew or Gentile. We say amen, but, but is, is it really amen? Is it yes and amen here? I wonder. There's a lot of amens in the church, but I'm not so sure that they're yes and amen. I am a disciple. That's what I am. That is all I am. You remember some of these books that we've been reading where he says, I'm writing to the saints in Christ in Colossae. I just happen to be in America. Thank God that I am. Very blessed for that to be the reality. That's not my life. You take it back, Gordon. Blasphemy. Stone him. <laughs> There's no Jew or Gentile. 
I ain't about that anymore. <gasps> you take that back. I know some of you are like, I'm... <laughs> see, I've already been through that process. So I can be patient with you. I have did all the gagging in the prayer closet when God was delivering me from this. No circumcision or uncircumcision. Don't talk to me about your creed. I'm only interested in Christ. That's what I'm interested in. If we get Christ right, the creed will take care of itself. Circumcision, uncircumcision, circumcision, uncircumcision. They've been arguing about it forever. Tongues, no tongues. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Once saved, always saved. God's sovereignty, man's election, will, but... Bye. I want to talk about Christ. That's what I want to talk about. That's what I'm interested in. I I'm in a new family. And there's only one person. What? One person. Which means there's one personality. Male and female. I'm so sick of that, especially in the church. I expect it out there in the world, the battle of the... See, we don't even have the... Do we even have the battle of the sexes anymore? I don't even think we can, right? That's all been destroyed by... Yeah. There's no male or female. There's no bond or free. I wonder how many people sit in the church and look across the congregation and see every face, no matter what the pigment of their skin no matter their culture or background, no matter what class they are, no matter what their bank account says, no matter what they're wearing, and they recognize, that's my brother, that's my sister. We are one in Christ, and that's all that matters. And do you know that this is what Jesus said? The whole world would know that we were following him by the love we have one for another, but we can't do that because the devil's convinced us that there's Jew and there's Gentile and there's male and there's female and there's bond and there's free. And Put it off. Put it off. Put it off and put on the new man. I'm going to tell you, the new man is great. It's great. I don't have to deal with all that junk. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. That means you are chosen. You want some motivation, reasons why you should put that stuff off and put on the new man? You were chosen. That is mind-boggling to me that the God of the universe said, Gordon. I'm still dumbfounded. I'm still looking up into heaven and going, I know you are all-knowing, but why? I know that you are God and I shouldn't be. Why? Do you see me? God, do you? See? You know what I did last summer. Chosen. But not just chosen. Look what he says. The elect of God. Holy. He didn't just choose me. He separated me. He, separate, he took me out from the world, out of darkness. He translated me into the kingdom of his son to be different. Some of you don't want to be different. You say, well, you don't know me, Gordon. It's human nature not to want to be different. Do you know that... Um, Scientists argue about the stripes on zebras and why they're there and what they're purpose for. And some people are like, well, it's for camouflage. Well, okay, wait a minute. You look at the leopard, the leopards out there in, 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 the, in the woods, in the, in the brush, and he does disappear. But a zebra, man, you can see a zebra forever. <laughs> I mean, you, know, you can see that joker a long way away. It can't be... For camouflage, can it? But it can be for camouflage because, because zebras run in herds. Just like fish are in schools. And human nature is to go to the center of the pack because that's the safest place. Because the predators pick out the ones 
on the outside extremities of the school or of the herd. And so you just want to get lost in the crowd. I had a lot of people say, Gordon, we love Solomon's Porch. We want to go to a big church. We want to go to a big church so nobody realizes if we didn't show up on a Sunday. Right? We, we want to slip into the crowd and nobody knows that we're there or we're not there and we can just kind of come and go as we please and do our own thing. We, we want to just disappear. God says, I chose you and I called you out. I separated you. I want you disappearing. I've made you, I've made you a city on a hill. I want you to be seen. I want you to be heard. Amen? Amen. But our insecurities and our fears... Because we're covered up with all this other stuff except the new man. The new man ain't scared. Because the new man is being renewed in the image of Christ. And he was never scared. You think Jesus walked into a multitude and went, um, uh, Peter, Peter, I'm a little... Uh, no. Everywhere he went. He was bold as a lion. So as I am renewed into that image, he is setting me free from the stuff that he's asking me to put off. And listen, y'all, religion tells you to put all that on. You've been duped. But Jesus will set you free. Elect of God, holy and beloved, you are loved How many of you know, raise your hand if you believe you're loved by God. Now put your hand down if, hold on, hold it up, hold it up. Now put your hand down if you doubt it most of the time. We need to, we, we need to pray because some folks just lied up in here. Because our lifestyle doesn't, doesn't dictate that. Oh, I know God loves me. I know God loves me. And I'm going to live like God loves me. Or do I? Or do I? Well, when things don't go the way that I want, oh. When things don't go the way that I want them to go, well, it, it tells me that God doesn't love me because if God loved me, he would do what I Hmm, that sounds like the old man. <laughs> I think we're confusing our uniforms. You are chosen, you are separated, you are loved. Now, y'all want to really get excited? You ready to get excited? Ready to get pumped up? Okay, we're going to read the description of what the Holy Spirit is trying to turn us into. You excited? You ready? Here we go. Bowels of mercies. We would say compassion. How much compassion do you see in the Christian community today? We were predestined, church, for this. For this. Today might be a good day that we decide if this is what we want or, or just stop showing up. <gasps> Gordon. I mean, come on. Bowels of mercies. You know the Bible says that Jesus was moved with compassion. Now, here's what I love about this. You can't fake this. We can, fake, we can fake the stuff that, that church tells us to do. Right. Sing. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. You know, we, can do, we can do all that. Yeah. yeah. We, we can fake all of that. We can be living in absolute bondage and stand in the sanctuary and sing, Victory in Jesus. We can be lost and sing, My Savior forever. You ever watch some of the awards with the country music and, and the pop and all of that? And they all get up there and say, amazing grace. And then they do all the little swirls and stuff with their voice. And everybody's like all moved with a few tears. 
They had thought about Jesus since the last time they sung Amazing Grace at the last awards. We can fake all of that stuff, but you cannot fake bowels of mercy. That is a Christ thing. That is a God thing. And you will never have that if you don't spend time with him. Beholding him, loving him, adoring him for that. And the Holy Spirit is changing me. It's being imprinted upon me like Moses in the mountain. My face will glow. You can see it. It's attractive. I'm drawn to that. His mercy, his compassion. And we walk into the church and we judge. Look at her. <sighs> Lord, if you were a prophet, you'd know what kind of woman that was. You need to hush, Simon, because you don't know what you're talking about. The God of the universe is ministering to this woman's soul. Bowels of mercy, kindness. That word in the Greek means to profit. Do you know the Bible says that Jesus went about doing good? Everything he did was good. He did all things well, another gospel writer says. Can't fake that either. We're starting to describe something that is contrary to the flesh. The flesh don't want to be compassionate. The flesh wants compassion. The flesh doesn't want to be kind. The flesh wants everybody to be kind to it. You can tell when people have been with Jesus. You can tell. And I don't know about you, but I know some people who spend time with him. And I just want to be around them and him more more humbleness of mind <laughs> wait a minute Gordon that doesn't sound like God oh you don't know him if you don't think that sounds like God you don't know him how could God be humble he's God that's the problem right we don't understand leadership we don't understand authority we don't understand power Humbleness of mind. Lord, please help us. Oftentimes we sit in service, we hear these truths, they go in one ear and out the other. We ask for your grace this morning. Help us to hear what you're saying to us. In Jesus' name. Humbleness of mind. Humbleness of mind. Philippians chapter 2. And then he says, meekness. <laughs> I got saved in a charismatic church, y'all. I got saved in a church where you was, you was to live in the power of God. And everybody had to have that power. And they acted weird, like they had something they didn't have. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's like, See, when I got into Scripture and I started studying the Gospels, I never see Jesus acting like that. No. Peter, Peter, pick him up, pick him up. <laughs> I never see him do that. And the Bible says he was given the Spirit without measure. The most Spirit-filled man who ever walked this planet. Church folks act weird. They act foolish. They act ignorant. And they act that way because they don't know the one who bears the image in which God is trying to change them into. Humbleness of mind, meekness, that is strength under control. It's not weakness. Many of you guys are like, you hear weakness, I don't want nothing to do with that. I ain't weak. I ain't a wimp. May I remind you this morning that Jesus said of himself, I am meek and lowly. My money's on him. Between you and him, my money's on him. No matter what the contest is, my money's on him. And, and his spirit resides in me. 
And the true sign of power, the power of God in my life, is not how much power I have over you. It's how much power he has over me. Is that not the fruit of the Spirit? Self-control. Everybody wants to control everything. Your politicians want to control you. Preachers want to control you. Spouses want to control each other. Parents want to control their children. Over the next two weeks, we're going to talk about some of those things. I encourage you, if you're married, come next week. And if you have kids, come the next week. But we all want to have control over stuff. And all the while, the Holy Spirit is saying, Gordon, I just want to control you. This is the new man. This is the new man that he's speaking of. How about this one? Let's try this one on for size. Y'all ready? Let's go back into the fitting room. Just a minute. I'll be right out. What do you think? Huh? Does it fit? Long suffering. Ooh. Well, maybe, Gordon, I don't want to be as much like God as, as I thought. That is sad. That is sad. Love suffers long and is kind. Because here's what love knows. You ready? None of you can do anything to me that God does not allow. That's right. That's right. None of you. None. Not in word. Not in deed. Unless he allows it. Yes. Do we believe that? Do we believe that the next time we walk into class or we walk into the boss's office? Do we believe that when we walk into the sanctuary? Put on the new man. Oh, put on the new man. Is somebody messing with the clock? Take your time. Look at verse 13. Forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. The word forbearing there means to put up with. You know, folks don't put up with much anymore. They're just not willing to put up with anything. They're offended by everything. They get mad about everything. They get their feelings hurt about everything. They judge everything. Do you guys have any idea how much Jesus puts up with in my life? Do you have any idea? I know some of you, oh, you're the pastor. No. I'm not the teacher's pet. I'm the problem child. He's got me up here by the chalkboard because I'm an, I, I would make a big mess out there sitting with you. I'd, I'd destroy this church. I, I would. I would absolutely destroy this church if I was out there. So he puts me up there in the corner, and y'all just think I'm a teacher's. I'm not a teacher's pet. He, he, keep a, he keep a close eye on me. <laughs> keep my hands filled with, uh, with erasers. He's wait for class to be over and get back to work, right? Forbearing, putting up with, and forgiving. You say, well, Gordon, when they ask for my forgiveness, I'll give it. You need to read your Bible, sir and ma'am. Because on the cross, when nobody asking for nothing, and Jesus declared, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We check our theology. You see, everything changes when we catch a good glimpse of who he is, right? It's, it's, so, it's so easy. We put, well, you know, well, if, if people ask you to forgive and they repent, then you forgive them. That's, that's what we believe around here at this here church. Well, y'all just go and believe that because I don't believe that. Because Jesus don't believe that. Right. Oh. It changes everything, doesn't it? When we see him for who he is. Yeah. Oh, almost done. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Love. Your Savior is love. He is love. And the more, more time I spend with him, the more loving I will become. 
the more loving you will become. I haven't shared this publicly, but I think this would be a good time for me to confess it. About a month ago, I was up here and I taught, stepped off the stage, left after locking up, and I was burdened, burdened in my heart. I felt convicted, deeply convicted. And so all that day and all through the night and all the next morning, I'm just praying and I'm, I'm pondering, I'm thinking about everything that I said. And so I sent a text out to some, some guys that I trust, and, and they all text back and said, I, I, I don't think, I, I didn't see anything that you said wrong or, or anything. And I was hoping that would make me feel better, but it didn't make me feel better. I was just like, oh, yeah, but, and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed all week. I prayed and sought God, and finally I heard God say, it's not enough, Gordon to speak the truth. You must speak it in love. Because when you don't speak it in love, you are misrepresenting me. And I, I felt like God was saying, that's your last warning. Above all things, put on love. Put on love. We're to represent him in all things. Amen? Amen. Oh. And let the peace of God rule in your heart to the which you are called into one body and be thankful. It's a divine peace. It's a ruling peace. And it's a uniting peace. Do you know that Peace is the characteristic of the community of God. Do you know that God wants you to be at peace? I, I heard some, mm hmm. Right? I, that, that was like down here. And I heard some, yeah, mm hmm, yeah. Like, yeah, of course, Gordon. When are you going to give us a hard fill in the blank test? But how do I live? Do I live in peace? Am I at peace this morning? How many of you know if Paul is saying, let the peace of God, then you cannot let it? I think there's a lot of people in the church not letting the peace of God rule. And that word rule there means to umpire. He's the one that calls fair foul. Just turn it over to him. Let him rule. He's the prince of peace. Let him rule in peace. He'll give you perfect peace if you'll keep your mind on him. Instead of your bills. Instead of your neighbor. Instead of your spouse. Instead of your children. Instead of your problems. Instead of Ukraine. Instead of Taiwan. Instead of the Middle East. Instead of the election. Instead of special counsels. Perfect peace whose mind has stayed on thee. Jesus says, I've given you peace. And then he goes on to say, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. See, the more I know him, the more I can be at peace. The more I can be at peace. And then he says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Let his peace rule. Let his word reside. I, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse all the time, but I'm trying my best to encourage every one of you. Saturate your life with God's word. As much as you possibly can, stop scrolling, stop watching the news, Get in your Bible, read it, listen to it, study it, memorize it, meditate upon it. Because it's a lamp unto your feet. It's going to be the thing that sets you free. It's the thing that's going to build your faith. It's going to be the thing that reveals Christ to you. It's going to make you strong and wise unto salvation. And I could go on and on and on and on and on. Let his peace, let his word. And then whatever you do, he says... 
in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. See, when, when his peace is in our heart, praise will be on our lips. Songs, hymns, spiritual songs. Some people are uncomfortable during worship because they're like, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do. I mean, we've already sung this four times. I mean, why are we singing it again? Because when his peace is there and his presence is there, you can't help but to sing. You can't help but to sing. Right? You can't help but to sing. When his peace is ruling in me and his word is residing in me, then and only then, listen, when his peace is ruling in me, when his word is residing in me, then and only then can I represent him rightly. And those who represent him, do it with thanksgiving. In gratitude, in gratitude is a sign of denial of God's work in your life. You are denying God's work when you are ungrateful. Every good gift comes from him. Everyone, everyone. And a man can receive nothing except to be given him from above. We need more time. Maybe we should start doing like a, an overflow service, right? We'll, we'll finish the service and those who want to leave can leave. And, and those who want to linger, we just kind of gather together and just keep, keep going. I encourage you. Saturate your life in Christ. It's the thing you're longing for. It's the thing you're looking for. And my heart aches for a church filled with people who know Christ, who truly know him. That church will change the world. Let's stand.